Peter Mooney is uh, working at the Department of Computer Science at the Maynooth University of Ireland. Um, everybody who has, uh, to some extent, been exposed to to education and teaching during the pandemic knows that there were plenty of challenges during the the last year. Um, so Peter uh, now wants to share with us his experiences with uh, using Phosphor-G in the university classroom during the pandemic. So I'm very keen on hearing what you have to uh, to tell us, Peter. So uh, the Thank floor you. is all yours. Thank you very much, Stefan, for the introduction. And uh, it's certainly uh, my presentation uh, this evening for me anyway is uh, just a, a personal look back at, at the last 18 months or so. And again, uh, the experience of using Phosphor-G in, in the university classroom in this different environment of teaching in a, in, in a purely virtual or a, a remote teaching uh, situation. So I, I have been, been teaching in the university now for six years and all of those previous years before last year were your standard classical uh, classroom and laboratory uh, situation. But then of course, last year that changed completely for, for many uh, millions and billions uh, of people around the world. So my presentation today takes three uh, treat streams, but uh, they, they don't necessarily go in a linear order like this. I'll just reflect a little bit on, on those personal experiences. I'll talk about what I found to be the major advantages to using Phosphor-G in teaching uh, during the pandemic. And even now in the new normal, as I begin the new academic year, as we return back uh, to normal, and then maybe some ideas about the future role that Phosphor-G can play in this technology-based uh, learning, because we now understand that uh, the, the role of teaching and learning must embrace different types of technologies to be successful. <clears throat> so as some of you may be aware, there's there's been quite a lot of literature already uh, published in the last 18 months about every possible aspect of the, the COVID-19 situation. And the last two speakers both had uh, presentations which had that very team. And the, the academic community have been looking at COVID-19 in a number of, of different ways. But one of the things that are attracting a lot of attention at the moment is looking at the impact of what has happened and also the possibility of what we can learn going forward. So for example, a paper out last year called for open science in this time when all of our borders and we were all prevented from traveling and moving around as normal, this was an opportunity for us to embrace an open approach uh, in, in, our, uh, in, in education. Of course, with this, there has been a lot of uh, advice given by teachers for teachers and uh, by students in, in terms of feedback. And uh, I've just shown three screenshots here of, uh, of three openly available uh, papers on that topic. I did find it funny that uh, this screenshot from, from last March had five tips for moving teaching online. And then the automated uh, button here had find a new job. So I'm not sure whether that was uh, tip number six or not. But all of these uh, tips and uh, approaches to teaching and learning in, in this period of time usually focused uh, not so much on what tools students were using, but rather on the tools using to deliver learning. So was it a platform such as Zoom or was it a platform such as Microsoft Teams or uh, Skype or, or some other platform that was available for that type of online classroom? So just to give some, some context uh, from a people perspective, uh, my 
my two full-time modules are both postgraduate modules in the university. And one of them is uh, spatial databases. And the other is mobile application development. And the really nice thing about both of these modules is that I have a, a very international cohort in, in both modules. But also I have a nice mixture of people who are from a non-ICT background. So they're not always expert in using computers in uh, programming or development. Many students will, will never have programmed or, or written software before. The teaching load is quite heavy in, in both, but what's uh, the biggest challenge, I think, in the last uh, year or so has been the fact that the need to deliver those laboratory and practical sessions to students so there's quite a lot of practical hours associated with uh, with those so the the topics and I, I don't think i need to really go into the topics here in detail because it, it's it's not really relevant the exact topics or maybe the order that i teach them in but i'll just leave that slide there for a moment for those who who want to to read through Obviously, the spatial database course deals with working with spatial databases, uh, trying to do some spatial analysis uh, on the data within the database, using Postgres and PostGIS as the, 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 the core piece of machinery. In the mobile application development module, we're looking at uh, developing using uh, React JavaScript and trying to give students the opportunity to develop uh, mobile applications that are cross-platform or hybrid. Now, in terms of technologies, uh, I was in the happy position, I think, of finding myself in an online teaching scenario uh, last year, but not having to necessarily change the tools that I've used, because I've always been very involved with uh, open source software. I, I have involved here in Ireland in the OSGO local chapter. I'm the, the European chair for geo for all So the, 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 the use of open source software, the use of, of Phosphor-G in, in teaching and learning and research for me is not new. So in some senses, maybe I had a little bit of a head start to people who were, were not familiar with the tools and we're trying to use them. So in, in spatial databases, we use the PostgreSQL stack. We have a look at SQL Lite. We offer opportunities to use other uh, database clients, such as uh, DB Beaver, just to give students uh, an experience of another client. QGIS is the, the major tool for visualization and analysis. OpenStreetMap provides us with all that great data that we can use. We look at Leaflet uh, in, in one of our lectures for producing simple maps. And then the students create some screencasts for me as part of their project work using uh, OBS Studio. In mobile application development, uh, you may be familiar with these tools, but our traditional stack was using Node.js, uh, using a nice text editor such as Atom. And again, we use React. We did some mapping applications and students also made a screencast. Now, the departmental context is we have our PostgreSQL server, which is available to all the students, and it's available internally and externally. So the way the database administrators have uh, set up the server is that each module in the, in the department has their own private database, and within that database, each student has their own schema, which is PostGIS enabled. And PG Admin 4 is the preferred PostgreSQL client. Uh, so the technicians, the tech guys in the department can offer some support for, for PG Admin 4. And certainly for my, my materials, I use uh, PG Admin. But any client uh, that can connect is, is absolutely fine. And then I suppose the bigger context, because the department fits inside the university. And this is maybe where there is the biggest uh, 
the biggest challenge because there are certain tools and platforms that the university would like you to use. And I, I think some people in the audience today will be familiar with tools such as Moodle. So that's the, the platform where students and teachers interact in terms of exchanging uh, materials, uh, in doing assessments, etc. When we needed to do our online teaching, we were we were asked to use Microsoft Teams uh, because there is obviously the Microsoft platform in the university. Teams work very well for, for students and teachers, sharing uh, large files, etc., through OneDrive. And then when I made some videos, etc., for students, we always made them available on Microsoft Stream because it meant the students didn't have to download large video files. Uh, if they had a bad connection. We are lucky to be connected to a, to a high-speed network. HEANet is a, a mirror for uh, almost all of the great open source software around the world. So if students want to download you know, daily builds of, of things or, or the, the, the source code for anything, there is a quick connection there to, uh, to HEANet. So the... The big change for both of my modules were the, the, the translation of a traditional lab or workshop to a remote lab or workshop. And it, this presented a lot of challenges. So what I'm asking you, if you're not familiar with this, is to think about a Phosphor G workshop or even a local chapter workshop. And, and one of the great things about those, when we run them here in Ireland, we really, we really love those parts of the of the, the national conference because it allows people to sit on a one-to-one -one connection basis and, and learn on an in-person basis. So how to try and replicate that when people are distributed all around the world uh, and everything is, is based just through the screens of, of uh, Microsoft Teams. So that was a really major challenge. And I suppose that's reflected in, in the literature through people like Ortiz, for example, who has said that what we've had to do is, is translate the old to the virtual. And I've just highlighted two which the author here has mentioned and two which I have been trying to sell to everybody that I can over the last few years, that the more that we would make open educational resources and open content, such as open data, the, the, the easier this translation process will be. Because if we are already familiar with using those type of resources, then in a situation that is rapid and unplanned, I think there's an opportunity there to move in a much more seamless uh, type of, of way. There was also the need to move to this idea of mini lectures using video and audio in a much more creative way. One of the big changes uh, for us in, in CS385, the mobile application development, was to move from a local Node.js approach to an online IDE. Now, if you've ever worked with uh, Node.js before and, and uh, developed you know, React or, or Angular, on uh, on your own local machine, you realize that when you create an application, there's a huge download of uh, of node modules. And uh, I, I always find this diagram funny that uh, it just seems that when you look in the folder of node modules, it just seems to be millions of <laughs> JavaScript files. The problem there for, for someone on an unstable internet connection is that this, this can take a long time. There's also Windows folder security issues that can, can crop up. So the online IDE we moved to was uh, Code Sandbox, which is free to use and integrates very well with, with GitHub. And the students really liked this because it meant that they could actually even work with their own tablet device. They didn't need a, a powerful laptop or a powerful a, a powerful desktop machine. Uh, the, the IDE there was very self-explanatory and very easy to use. So the, the, I, I've kind of outlined some of the challenges and a couple of other challenges that, that I've seen there was 
the assumption of digital literacy amongst all students. And this is a very unfair assumption on, on young students. So people of my age and older just assume that because students were born in the last 20 years that they are immediately fully digitally lit literate. But in fact, teachers and students in the technology sphere may not have all of those skills that you would be expecting. So you can't simply assume that someone will know how to make a video using uh, OBS Studio or someone will know how to <coughs> download and unzip a file and move files, etc. You need to uh, carefully provide useful support for, for everyone. Another important aspect of online teaching, and I, I found this in quite many ways, was the, a supportive and sensitive environment for students. Many students told me in, in private messages that they felt quite lonely and quite, uh, you know, quite left out because they didn't feel as if they were part of, a, of, an, of an environment, of a classroom, of a class. So it was very important to allow students some support around, for example, getting assessments in or asking questions because you had to realize that this was a very difficult time for, for them also. And part of that process was giving proactive and good feedback to students. I also learned the value of providing good video screencasts. Uh, maybe two years ago, I would have dismissed the idea of creating small videos. But I got really positive student feedback in our surveys around the use of videos for technical procedures. So just I've shown a couple of examples here. The converting a CSV file to a post-gist table or maybe taking a shape file in, in QGIS and uh, creating a table in uh, PostgreSQL PostGIS. Students really liked these because they could look at them over and over again and they're so much better than explaining than a set of uh, lecture notes. I always made the original videos available for offline viewing, but they were always available in the streamed uh, environment as well. In terms of the Phosphor G, I found, an, I found four major advantages. And one of them was the Phosphor G community itself. As I mentioned uh, a few slides ago, there is a real international cohort uh, to both classes. There's many, many uh, natural native languages, native tongues that are, are not English, the first language. And several students told me about their ability to access support for PostgreSQL and QGIS, etc., in their own native language and their own native country. I think that's fantastic that that support is available. There was also the ability to support devices that we couldn't see. So I wasn't able to see what laptop or, or what desktop someone had or really what software was already installed there. But it seemed that Phosphor-G software, OSGO software that we were using was already capable of, of dealing with these type of issues. I, I believe, although I don't really have hard data to support this, that I think a Phosphor-G approach actually helped reduce stress overall in the environment because we didn't have to worry about licenses for student machines. Students very often told me that they may have to install their software on two devices in their household because they may be sharing the, the family computer with everyone and they may have their laptop, which also may be shared. The use of open data meant that uh, there was no problems around uh, you know, licensing of the data. And it also is very interesting for students to download data that they, they can find themselves. And I think then from, from my teaching point of view, there's an ability to produce educational material that you have confidence would work on unknown devices or unknown hardware, et cetera, uh, without wondering if it's going to work on a Pacific machine. So obviously there were some, some issues, but on the whole, it was, was quite successful. 
what would be the perfect scenario going forward? I think there's a few things. Uh, we had a few issues last year about installing PostgreSQL, the, the full database server, uh, on Windows. And that's obviously a Windows problem. It's around the security folders. I don't really understand. But uh, Linux and Mac seem to have no problems. So students wanted to have the database as a local host. And that saved all this connection uh, over an internet connection. Uh, we used Heroku a little bit uh, for a hosted PostgreSQL option. AWS, some of the students complained, was a bit complicated. So maybe for beginners, AWS was a little bit uh, complicated. And maybe even uh, if people had suggestions about online virtual machines, this would be another way to help students who maybe couldn't afford a laptop or who, who wanted to use a machine of, uh, of better spec. So just to finish off with, with three slides, OSG Live would have been absolutely ideal for this scenario if we could have predicted what was going to happen uh, because OSG Live has everything pre-installed, it's ready to go, the students are ready, and it's really suited to the modules that I teach. But it needs a lot of planning and the planning has to come from me, the instructor, because we have to... I think we have to try and get USB keys into students' hands because the download may be too big for many students' internet connections. Uh, and, uh, and that might uh, make, a, make a problem or a barrier. I suppose there's also time to make the course video content specific to OSGO Live. So that's something that I would have to plan better for. And it might be a little bit challenging in the remote environment because, as I said, Many of my students are not from an ICT background, so they may be a bit worried about, uh, you know, taking on something like OSG Live, booting from a USB key, for example, uh, working in a Linux environment for the first time. So I, I, I think now that we've been through this, this is an opportunity for people like myself as an instructor to plan maybe going forward to use this type of um, approach. I also asked a question, could we promote teaching better within the community? Uh, and as part of geo for all that's one of our, our remits. And I have in red a line I was thinking that teaching with Phosphor-G is a little bit different in, how to, in teaching how to use Phosphor-G. The two of them are slightly different because teaching with Phosphor-G means that there's an... There is a lot of, uh, the students have an incentive to learn there. There is also the fact that there is something tangible at the end for them. So, so there's an added pressure and the Phosphor-G tools can reduce that pressure by being, being easy to use and, and all of those reasons I've given. Perhaps there's an opportunity to have a, a Pacific track on teaching alone using these tools and to gather lots of experiences from all around the world on how we can do things better in the future. Now that we've been through 18 months of, of a lot of change and that things may, may never be the same again. So in conclusion, you could argue that this is a biased experiment because uh, I, I, we cannot run the same experiment with a non-FOSS approach uh, in the exact same circumstances. So this is really uh, one person's opinion. Uh, Personally, I, I think it did make the situation much easier to cope with. Reducing student stress around software configuration and usage, I feel, is a major plus because if a student gets a little bit stressed at the beginning and things are not starting to work for them, it can have an impact further down uh, the road. The virtual classroom does take uh, a lot more work on everyone's behalf, but the outcome is we've lots of reusable materials. And finally, there's huge potential, huge potential because of the fact that I had two classrooms of students all over the world who are now proficient in using many different phosphor G type tools. So that's the next generation of students and graduates in the phosphor G system. And the more people we have in the Phosphor-G and OSGO ecosystem around the world, the better it is for everybody. So 
thank you again for uh, for watching. It's been a pleasure to present, and uh, I look forward to some of your questions and comments. Yes, thanks, Peter. Lots of things that I personally also can relate to, and it seems also a couple of people in the audience. So there are both uh, comments and questions. Uh, let's start with uh, with the questions, though. Um, I think the first one is: uh, Do you see any reason not to teach with uh, phosphor G? Okay, that's a great question. I've never I've never thought of it uh, that way. Uh, I don't, to be honest, because I, I think from a, a, a resource point of view, and if we talk about resources being maybe time and energy in terms of developing content and teaching, I would imagine that using a non-FOSS approach would, in the times that we've had, would probably require the same uh, amount of effort. The, the reason not to teach uh, the reason to teach with FOSS and not the other way would be the community and that ability to get help and to get advice to 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 find resources. So I would think that uh, that ability for students that have have given me feedback that they were able to get help within their own uh, native native language within their own country was a, was a major advantage because it was like. A technical support that they could reach out to. So, I uh, I don't see a reason not to teach with it, but I can understand that many other teachers who are not phosphor G literate would maybe see an obstacle in converting all of their teaching practice and materials to uh, a phosphor G approach. So, it's it's maybe something that a teacher who considers this approach would have to do in a in a phased uh, manner maybe not try to change completely all in a, a single year but over the course of a, a number of years or semesters okay there are there are actually so many questions that I don't think we can address all of them um, <laughs> one thing that I also experienced quite a lot is um, sort of challenges with um, collaboration among students. Did students also group projects? If yes, how did they go about collaborating? Well, th this is where I found students to be the most inventive and innovative. And they really made me feel like an old person for, <laughs> for the first time. Because we, we had a group project uh, in our mobile application course. And I set Microsoft Teams as being the, the, the platform to, uh, to have meetings on. But students were using Discord, students were using WhatsApp, students were using lots of other tools. So it's almost as if uh, they knew of a whole ecosystem of tools for meeting and collaborating that, that I didn't know about. So I actually learned a lot from the students in that respect. And the, 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 the difficult thing about collaboration there was to be management from my side, ensuring that I was able to keep in touch with the student groups and check in with those students to make sure that everything is but uh, set up their their project meetings and, and scheduling on those type of tools okay another question last one maybe is geo for all somehow reacting to this shift in the way of teaching is delivered well i suppose uh at the moment, we are all just reacting and trying to settle down after the, the, the shift. But I think now is, is a great opportunity for us to take stock, see what has happened, see what the positives are, see what maybe the negatives are also, and try and, and plot a way, a way forward. That's why I was suggesting that maybe in, in, in future conferences, even regional, not just a global conference, that there is an opportunity to have a track based on teaching where we're not necessarily uh, you know, giving hard statistical data about our, our teaching practice or, or the classroom, but very often it's the experiences of teachers in different courses, in different universities or different uh, schools all around the world. We could actually then find the best way to react and maybe geo for all is a platform that OSGEO could use in, in helping 
spread the word about a new way or the 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 next phase in in teaching in technology based teaching okay thank you peter i'm afraid we have to move on thank to the you, next Stefan. speaker um no those problem. of you thank who you. didn't uh, whose questions didn't get asked uh, please get in touch with P peter then directly so thank you peter